Hello, welcome to the special conversation that I'm having with Asmarom, who is originally from Tigray. We wanted to have this discussion in order to elucidate the viewing audience about some of the issues that the communities in the current conflict have had about what it means to be part of your country, what it means to fight for the truth, and essentially how we can reconcile our differences. Asmaram, uh, I was just getting to know you previously, but just in case for people who don't already know who you are, could you introduce yourself and uh, uh, allow the audience to know uh, about who you are? Hey, thanks, thanks, George. Uh, yeah, so my name is Asmaram. Um, I was born in Arwa and Tigray, uh, but I've lived all my life in New York City. Um, I graduated Hunter College with a degree in political science, and I've worked for a year as a community organizer for a non for profit based in the city. And um, that's, I mean, that's basically who I am. Obviously, this, I've always had an interest in Horn of Africa politics, specifically Ethiopian and Eritrean politics for years as I am passionate about American politics as well. Um, but what makes this conflict especially um, pertinent is because it's directed, directly affected me and my family, you know? And I think that's definitely keen my interest in, you know, the geopolitics of what's going on in the country and in the region at large. Well, Asmaram, what would you say at this point in time, we're speaking, um, as the war has intensified and as um, air, airstrikes have really uh, decimated the region. What is your reflection on the political and military situation, not only in Tigray, but in Ethiopia? I think, I think really the country is at a crossroads. Um, there are many variables and many things that are happening within the country that is simply out of the control of the prime minister himself. I mean, can he really, is he really in the position to, for example, eject not only Eritrean troops, but also Eritrean security officers that are based in Addis Ababa, sent by the regime in Asmara. Um, you know, militias such as, you know, the OLA, uh, the Gumuz militias in the Bashango Gumuz region. You have the Amhara militias who are currently occupying Western Tigray. You have the Tigrayan Defense Forces uh, in charge of most of the region. It seems like uh, the situation is quite precarious and there isn't really a solid group of power in Addis Ababa. It seems like um, Mr. Uh, the Prime Minister is basically the mayor of Addis Ababa and, and, and that's it. And I think we're seeing the ramifications of that as the city continues to expand and the sort of bubble that's always been associated with Addis Ababa is becoming bigger and bigger and bigger, both economically and socio-politically. And, uh, and I think we're seeing the dire ramifications of that. Yes, I think um, in terms of the growing influence of the Ethiopian government, uh, not just in the war, but also in the international stage more generally, I think we really, have seen a transformation of the country. And it is at a crossroads, I would agree that um, certainly uh, as the diaspora population I've noticed has grown more um, empathetic to the prime minister and his government, uh, there seems to be a dismissal of the suffering that has happened in the, in the country since November of 2020. And I think it's really a disappointment to be honest, uh, as you mentioned, it's going to be very difficult for the prime minister to ask the Eritrean troops and the militias uh, to leave, considering that they have interests that are now implicated in the outcome of the war, especially Amhara troops who claim that uh, the Western disputed territory is theirs. And we're not here to speculate on anything that um, is unresolved, but it is important to note that these issues are not um, going to be easy to fix. And I mention that because um, most of the political leadership in the country, I would say, as you, as you rightly said, are kind of in a bubble and they really are trying to isolate themselves in order to keep uh, focus on, on their 
on their mission and their objectives. And speaking on the Eritrean troops in particular, I can speak to that because I'm Eritrean. Um, and we can talk about this further if you'd like. Uh, their presence has been absolutely devastating. Um, I can just say that openly and honestly. Um, I've been outspoken uh, about it since the beginning, but just to reiterate that their presence um, has negatively impacted the refugee population in Tigray, the civilian population in Tigray, of course, the civilians that were killed in Aksum, uh, in Dengalat, uh, and other places across Tigray, and in Humera, where they were shelled, uh, and subsequently um, lives were lost as a result of the military incursion in Tigray. So it's disheartening. And as well as the military, the troops that were recruited into this conflict as a result of uh, the GIFAs that occur in the country, uh, the recruitments of children, and the policy on education, which allows the military to um, really subsidize all of the youth in order to um, sustain the military fighting capacity, since Eritrea is not really that big of a country in, in terms of population. So I would say in this regard, yes, I think um, what you said is, is very important uh, to uh, take note of. How would you um, talk about this, uh, or how have you talked about this conflict with your family, if you'd like to share? Uh, or with your friends. I'm, I'm sure it's not an easy topic to discuss, uh, considering uh, that Tigray has been on the receiving end of, of a lot of war for, for months now. Right. Um, so most of the friends, you know, growing up in New York City, there isn't a big Tigray or even Habesha community in general. So most of my friends are sort of uh, in the dark. I mean, I explain what happens and, you know, they express solidarity to me, but there's a sort of... Um, you know they don't actually understand fully and 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 that's that's totally natural i mean it's a completely complex situation and just years and years of history behind it um but um i guess you know it, it's been it's been tough obviously because you know my family to grab been the receiving end of a lot of these atrocities like i've had a uh, an uncle who was actually murdered in in Aksum on that day in in uh, november of last year 2020 um by Eritrean troops uh I had a relative of my grandfather who who was essentially kidnapped by Eritrean troops and sent to the capital in Makala to be interned in order to um I guess prevent them from potentially joining the Tigray Defense Forces uh so you know just taking out the young men and and sort of interning them and and making sure that they're not a threat. Um, that's definitely, that's happened to a member of my family as well. I mean, the family that I have in Addis Ababa, you know, hundreds of miles away from the front line, having their homes raided, uh, brought in for questioning. So it's, um, so it's, I'm speaking from a very personal uh, point because this is something that's definitely affected i mean even even my uncle who works in addis Ababa but has since moved to new york with us he was uh, on his way to his flight and they accused him of hiding bombs in his suitcase and he had to sort of talk his way out of it when we all knew that that wasn't the case so um so this conflict isn't just like a headline for me or this conflict isn't just um, a debate topic it's very real you know so it's sort of harder for me to explain uh, without getting too personal because we want to keep things fact-based and we also want to keep things um, evidence-based as well in terms of empirics you know so it's not enough to say just my family's been affected but thousands of other people have been too you know so relaying that message is as I, I guess is a strategy that i've been using uh, to talk about this conflict to, you know, friends, family as well. Of course, um, since that time, the conflict has expanded into other regions and has affected other peoples as well. Uh, in addition to those who were already in Tigray, um, it's created, I would say, a very complex situation, as you stated, that uh, it's not simply um, uh, one party versus another party of the conflict. It's really an amalgamation of, of different 
political groups that have organized themselves in order to uh, dismiss a threat that they perceive uh, with uh, the Tigray Defense Forces and the TPLF. And I'm sure we um, kind of differ on their, their purpose in Tigray, but nevertheless, that has what has occurred since then. Um, I think what is troubling for me to understand that it's really something that I have had difficulty in understanding is that, you know, for many months until um, uh, our conversation, Prime Minister Abiy said that uh, what's happening in Tigray was an internal matter of the country. And I think part of the reason why I'm really interested to have this conversation with you is because of the military involvement of Eritrea and the political influence that the regime has in Ethiopia as well. It's something that I'm completely um, disturbed by, that a country could have that much influence over another country in order to do its bidding, essentially. And the result has been the mass suffering of, of people, of all walks of life, of, of civilians, of refugees, uh, from not just from Tigray, and even in Afar and Amhara, as we've seen now, um, as a result of the expansion of the, of the fronts in order to secure a humanitarian aid route that has unfortunately led into even more protracted killings, as um, uh, the Tigray Defense Forces have killed civilians as well, for revenge attacks and for other uh, purposes that they see fit in order to secure the humanitarian aid route, whether that's um, a direct consequence of the of the conflict, I think can be researched more. But nevertheless, it has created such. My point is, it's created such a complex situation that it's hard to rectify it, and it it's increasingly so uh, as uh, each day passes. And I always center back to what I what I stated about um, the involvement of Eritrea in this conflict because it's really um, something that I didn't think would have this profound of, of an impact. Um, as I as I stated, you know, this was an internal matter of Ethiopia, as Prime Minister Abiy said in his own words. Yet he is allowing Eritrea to be involved, and he's not calling it intervention on their part. He said, we welcome them. We want them to be uh, with us in the struggle. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of selective. You know, when the United States wants to ask for a secession to hostilities, there's suddenly an issue with the way that the United States has handled other conflicts in the past. Um, when the European Union and the coalition of countries that make up that entity want to do the same thing, Ethiopia uh, has a very hostile reaction, but Turkey, Iran, China, the United Arab Emirates, they have uh, a potential market in Ethiopia when it comes to military technology. And as long as it satisfies their interests, Ethiopia uh, will sing their praises. And the same, I guess you could say with Eritrea, although it's less about military technology and actually military strategy, the amounts of forces that they've been able to recruit over the past year it's unbelievable. Um, the human resources that have been used in this war have, are draining the country. And I think as a result, it really puts a burden on everyone in Eritrea um, to have to deal with the post-war situation, regardless of the outcome, whether or not uh, a certain side wins, if you can use that word. Um, where does where do the families go from here? Uh, you know, there's so much suffering that we're not really uh, discussing. You know, some people have been trying to express their disdain for for the war, but it seems like uh, the warring parties really don't care as long as their objective is is satisfied. Which, by the way, it's been how long has it been now? Almost uh, 14, 15 months since the war began, and you know, the Ethiopian government continues to say TPLF is dead, yet they keep insisting that they have to fight. And it, it just, it's a very, very uh, disturbing situation. How would you respond to, to that? 
Right. Um, well, when we when it comes to the foreign aspect of it, there's a serious. I seriously believe that Prime Minister Avi and his allies do not view Eritrea as a foreign country. There's a certain. I think I'm convinced they don't. I mean, and they and they show it through the rhetoric, right? You know, I, I saw this um, uh, state media post. You know, Ethiopia is the only country with its own alphabet when probably the oldest is, um, transcripts were actually found in what is now Eritrea, right? So, the, and, you know, we've seen a lot of uh, sort of Eritreans who are supportive of their government complain that they're not being recognized. And, uh, well, you are being recognized, but you're not, they don't think of you as Eritrean, they think of you as Ethiopian, you know, that's sort of uh, the place. And I kind of see the, the place that Eritrea has, hold, has, has held in, in um, Ethiopia as a sort of replacement for Tigrayans. So as we know, during, for 27 years, the TBLF was, had an outsized role in the country's security and military apparatuses. And as that waned, I guess they sort of tried to fill it with uh, maybe uh, with uh, security agents from Eritrea, if, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and as many Tigrayan officers defected from the National Defense Forces, people were justifying the involvement of Eritrea's army because they had to, quote unquote, fill the hole, you know. So um, there's that aspect of it. And it's also very hypocritical. I mean, we've, we've been hearing for a while, you know, African problems for African solutions. Well, there was an African solution to the human rights abuses in this war. Mm -hmm. The African Union did in last June. Uh, convene a group to investigate the crimes that have been committed in Tigray, not only by um, federal forces, but also Tigrayan forces as well. And uh, they were ordered to uh, cease and desist by the Ethiopian government. So we see a government that's constantly hostile and really compromising the diplomatic prowess it once had. I mean, as you know, uh, something like half of all the embassies and the consulates have shut down um you know and i think uh the foreign aspect of it i mean you know the fact that the african union and its predecessor organization the organization for african unity um being in addis Ababa has really had a devastating effect for the region of the horn of africa historically speaking right um you know as you know you guys were you know eritreans were fighting for their independence for 30 years how much concern did we hear from the Organization of African Unity uh, about Eritrea, at the, about the war that was going up in Eritrea, the famine, the bombings. Um, and when the, uh, when the coin flipped and the EPRDF took power, the EPRDF was able to occupy sovereign Eritrean territory for 20 years with very little resistance from the African Union, right? Um, the invasion of Somalia in 2006, right? So that's something that I think really needs to be reconsidered. Um, you know, Ethiopia being sort of the image and the bastion of, you know, Pan-Africanism has had a really devastating effect for the people who actually live there and live around the country. Um, and, and you're definitely right. I mean, if you disagree with the Ethiopian government, you're an agent for the State Department, uh, you want regime change, you want sanctions, you want to turn Ethiopia into Cuba or or Iran? When really, I mean, we have to stop pretending as if it's only the United States that has signaled the, that they wanted negotiations between the TPLF and the Ethiopian government. I mean, during the outbreak of the war, right? We saw um, the president of uh, Uganda, Museveni, convene a meeting in Kampala, inviting. I'll be inviting the, the Mechamukon, inviting several members of the Ethiopian government and just begging them to negotiate, right? Um, you know, uh, the president of Rwanda, just last year in February, he said quite openly, he's like, this situation has to be handled by the UN. What's going on to Gry is just, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's out of control, you know? Um, we had uh, the president of South Africa, Ramphosa, go to Addis Ababa, trying to convince them to have negotiations. We had the former president from Liberia come into Addis Ababa to try to convince the Abi government for negotiations. So, and we also had the Security Council just a few weeks ago, 
no, I think this was predicated on um, the fact that Dese and Kovalcha were taken by the Tigrayan Defense Forces back in November. And I guess that's what urged them to make the statement. But we had even then the United Nations Security Council say that there's no military conflict for this, there's no military solution for this conflict, and that um, there needs to be negotiations without preconditions. So it seems like the only people who aren't serious about negotiations are um, the Ethiopian government and also the TPLF. I mean, let's not forget when when Tigrayan forces uh, took over Shuarovit and uh, were slowly approaching the capital. You know, we didn't see this sort of urge by the TPLF to try to engage in negotiations. You know, um, they have offered, obviously, in the beginning, you know, Gitachareta famously had sort of like a laundry list of preconditions um, that would, um, that they would accept. This is back in July. This is fresh off of the victory after Operation Lula. And now, um, you know, the shoe's on the other foot. So what's been most unfortunate about this conflict is how military realities have dictated the um, willingness on both sides to negotiate. I think probably what you mentioned uh, about um, the Ethiopian government's I'm talking about the EPRDF's uh, previous conduct and their subsequent role in the region has such a tremendous influence on the perception of the TPLF now in the sense that people are not willing to really negotiate with them considering their history and actually excusing what's happened now in light of what happened previously. As, I, as you mentioned, Ethiopia's invasion of Somalia in 2006 is seen as something that, um, well, they deserve it, kind of, you know. Tigray deserves to be uh, invaded or to be starved because of what a political party did, uh, not even in their name, but in their own interest. So it's really interesting to see how um, politics have warped reality. And it's frustrating, it's very sad to see that civilians are the main victims of the mistakes of the political leaders in this region. And also people are just not willing to take responsibility for the actions that they've, that they've committed. Um, I think it's absolutely essential uh, that the African leadership throughout the continent uh, take more aggressive measures in order to stop the fighting. Uh, as you mentioned, the president of Rwanda, Kagame, has experience um, with genocide and with ethnic cleansing. And um, whether he is a good president or not is a different question. Uh, but the point that he made about it being uh, not a viable solution, not a viable situation, and that um, international arbiters need to resolve. The conflict is important, and uh, as well as Museveni and Rampafosa and Sirleaf um, have all stated their interest in trying to calm the situation down. But there are certain actors who see the potential for uh, their own interests to grow in Ethiopia, especially Turkey, China, the United Arab Emirates. Uh, in fact, when the Biden administration took office. The UAE took their base from Asab and they moved it to an island off the coast of, uh, of Yemen, uh, Param Island. So all of these interests are really what's the focus of, the, of these countries rather than actual the civilian uh, suffering. Um, and it's, it's quite hypocritical to read statements um, from the Chinese government to say that they support an open dialogue from the Ethiopian government, this so-called national reconciliation, when it doesn't include all the relevant actors. If you remember in the 2018 peace agreement, um, the TPLF and the Tigrayan government was not involved in the border delineation, even though they expressed their willingness to finally concede to that issue. And without involving everyone to the table to resolve those issues that have been longstanding, there will never really be a sustainable solution to, to that issue or to any other issue. Because, you know, Isaiah Soforki and Abi Ahmed more recently now have this commitment to completely annihilating their enemies. 
And you could say the same about the TPLF when they were in power, that they really did not want anyone else to share power with them when they were in, in charge of the country. So it's really a revolving door of, of power. And unfortunately, no one has really benefited from that except for a very few handful of people. The security agents that you mentioned um, from Eritrea, which are run by Abraha Kasa, um, they have been sanctioned somewhat, but uh, unfortunately, the Eritrean government has built it almost like a tolerance to sanctions and have found ways to avert the effects of those um, uh, sanction regimes. And uh, consequently, even now with Filippos, um, the general of the Eritrean army and other institutions such as the Hidri Trust, uh, Red Sea Trading Corporation, there's really no uh, no effect, uh, and this is not. I'm not supporting sanctions, but what I'm saying is um, a concerted effort to actually target the leadership is something to consider. Uh, I, I don't know if that's possible, but maybe you can speak speak on that. What do you think has to take place uh, in order for the international community to really recognize um, that uh, the leadership needs to be held accountable for what they've done. Do you think it's even possible? Yeah, unfortunately, I mean, I, I think you got it right. I mean, Eritrea has, um, the Eritrean state rather, and its ruling party has been sanctioned in uh, numerous occasions. There was an arms embargo, I think in 2009, imposed by the, uh, the Security Council. Um, but, you know, sort of the crushing economic sanctions that we've seen in Cuba and Iran hasn't really, um, which I don't support, but hasn't really been imposed on Eritrea. But nevertheless, the I guess the idea of sanctions can actually maybe um, ruin the country's uh, reputation, and maybe international investors might be less willing to um, invest in the country because the possibility of their investments being sanctioned. Um, so I, you know, with the economic sanctions, I'm 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 still going to be opposed to it. What I think should have been done especially right after the Tigrayan forces took over the regional capital of Makala, was just cargo planes of, um, of food and medicine and, and water just being delivered directly to Tigray. You know, there's three airports that can be used in Shara and Aksum and Mala. I think that should have been a, a no-brainer. Um, I, I, I really, yeah, I think that was just obvious. I mean, this isn't this. You don't. You don't have your sovereignty. Doesn't give you the right to starve your own population to death, right? And um, so, allowing airdrops and not applying economic sanctions is actually a win-win, right? So the general Ethiopian population don't suffer from the abuses their government is committing, and uh, concrete action is being used to avert what is now a humanitarian disaster. So. I think I think I, I, that type of bold action is definitely needed. Um, I mean, Ethiopia was removed from AGOA, but I don't actually consider that a sanction. I mean, AGOA is a trade deal. Um, the country was in flagrant violation of the terms of the trade deal. They were warned about it months in advance, and instead of trying their best to comply, they decided to keep doing the conduct then. You know, Ethiopian products can still go to the United States, right? They'll just be subject to the same taxes and tariffs that most other products would be subject to. So it's not a sanction. You know, no country has the right uh, of duty-free access into, into the United States. You know, that's not, that's not a, it's a privilege. It's literally a privilege. It's named a privilege. It's literally, there, there's no, there's no ambiguity, but that's, that's not a sanction. Um, but, uh, you know, but any if there if there were to be any international action on the ground, it has to be done through the African Union or through the United Nations. I, I just I don't I don't see any other way that it has to be that, that it could be done, in my opinion. I mean, if it's through the African Union, it would be better because, you know, we still can say, you know, African solutions for African problems. And it's something that I think, quite frankly, most of the other countries in the region would welcome. I mean, do you think Kenya would want a, a, a collapsed Ethiopia? Do you think that'll be good for South Sudan? Would it be good for Djibouti? It's not. So I, I, 
I think that'll be the best route uh, for things to, to go down to. Yeah, all of those uh, points that you mentioned are important for, for policymakers to think about when they engage with Ethiopian politicians or with international interlocutors. Um, recently, as of the recording of this uh, session, um, Jeffrey Feltman, who was the US Special Envoy uh, to the Horn of Africa, uh, stepped down. And if I understand correctly, his term was only supposed to last for six months, but nevertheless, he has um, decided to um, renege himself from that position at the end of January of 2022. Additionally, um, China has expressed its interest in creating a Horn of Africa envoy for the purpose of its international diplomatic missions. All of these things, I think, are a way to uh, involve the bigger powers in the world to really find a way to um, maximize their interest in Ethiopia and also to solve the issue in a way that benefits them. As I mentioned um, in previous conversations that I've had with other uh, guests and in my own personal um, chats with people, um, you know, China, the United States, um, these are countries that ultimately express their own interest when it comes to uh, international politics and foreign policy. Uh, perhaps the West and the East, as we think them as blocs, they may have their own political agendas or they may have their own ideologies or ways of thinking, but the actual interests that they pursue are the same. And even the ways that they pursue them are similar. Um, the United States, for instance, built its military capacity by installing bases all across the world. The China does the same thing. The United States and China economically are two of the most growing uh, economies in the world. They really do not have, though, like very broad or very diverse interests or very uh, wide ranging differences in their interests. Um, the way they go about it may differ, but certainly their political ideology, uh, liberal democracy versus more of an authoritarian style of government is really what their difference is. I mentioned that in the sense that uh, Ethiopia cannot afford to switch sides uh, and just expect for the situation to be stable uh, because if they go with um, a certain uh, ally or a certain power that they perceive as being um, uh, positive to their interest, you know, what what's restricting China or the United Arab Emirates to uh, expect more from Ethiopia's markets and uh, allowing them to have greater accessibility. As you mentioned, AGOA is a privilege that the United States has given to certain African countries in order for it to develop its trade, uh, especially around sustain, sustainment and uh, food uh, foodstuffs. I'm thinking, and I'm just uh, thinking out loud here, um, something that I don't think really a lot of people realize, maybe in the Eritrean context, if I can bring it back to that, is you know, the accessibility to these types of deals is something that a country has to work for. And the violations or the so-called um, intervention that Ethiopians are, are trying to raise awareness to, you know, they weren't really concerned when the United States was uh, involved in funding or development aid. Ethiopia's largest aid contributor is the United States. They receive a lot of monetary resources over the years. Uh, and now it's slowly starting to dwindle away. Um, and as, as a, at the same time, Eritrea, uh, does not really have much of relations with any country, but uh, especially the United States, they just perceive as being antagonistic uh, to their views. I'm talking about the government. Um, I think all of this is to say that the politics of the region has really transformed since the beginning of the war. It's really put people in a position to think uh, more critically about what is the objective in the short term and the long term of the countries in the Horn of Africa, and also internationally, how do people perceive 
Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, Somalia, Kenya, uh, countries that comprise that region in East Africa. Something I want to know more about uh, from your perspective is in Tigray, how are these issues being discussed? Um, the, for many years, the TPLF led the coalition that uh, was in charge of the government, but now that they have their own own issues to really to deal with in Tigray as the war progresses, how how does diplomacy work uh, under war? Are people uh, really is are those really the issues that people are talking about or uh, trying to secure humanitarian access? Or I'm I'm sure all these issues are intertwined together, but how do you think the conversations in the Tigrayan community are are going? Um, I think there's this um, realization, uh, sort of despair that a lot of Tigrayans are feeling is that, you know, nobody's coming, you know, we're a small state uh, subsumed by a much larger state who's currently in power. Um, you know, we don't really have the same diplomatic prowess as our opponents. So there's definitely been uh, that realization. Uh, I think I think obviously with the foreign involvement, especially when it came to the drones, I mean, the United Arab Emirates is greatly um, implicated in this and have been, in, uh, have, you know, rightfully been at the ire of many Tigrayans as well. So um, that's sort of the way that those conversations are going, that no one is really going to uh, come out and reach for us. Uh, as you saw, as you saw uh, when the Tigrayan forces were forced to pull out of the Maran Afa regions, uh, Isho de Bretzion come up, was the leader of the TPLF, you know, write a letter to the United Nations, um, decrying the use of uh, foreign technology against uh, Tigrayan civilians. So I think the perception is that the world has let us down. Um, and even, even our supposed allies, so we discussed how, um, how diplomatically astute the EPRDF slash TPLF was for, for years and years, they were also very close allies with China as well. You know, the introduction of infrastructure of, uh, you know, industrial parks. And I think that I, I remember hearing a story from an analyst that um, the Chinese were actually furious when they found out that uh, CEO Mesfin, the former, former uh, foreign minister of Ethiopia was murdered in cold blood. Uh, because he he was the spear, he spearheaded the relationship between the two countries. And, you know, Ethiopia under the EPRDF was sort of a door to, towards the rest of Africa. I mean, the Chinese literally paid for uh, the $200 million uh, African Union building in Addis Ababa under the EPRDF. So that has been, uh, and obviously the Security Council has been quite disappointing. Uh, they haven't lived up to their uh, um, it's not so different than any other conflict, right? When America's friend, Israel, Saudi Arabia does something bad, the Americans cover for them in the Security Council. When China or Russia's friend or China or Russia itself does something bad, they cover for themselves or for their friends in the Security Council. So those are sort of the conversations that we've been having in our community that the world has let us down. Um, the international community as a tool for resolving this crisis has uh, been quite woeful. And uh, well, I guess we'll have to, to wait and see what, what happens next. What do you think has to happen uh, in order for the community, international community to wake up? It's really a conflict that has attracted into uh, a civil war, uh, not just on the battlefield, but also on social media. Um, the amount of rhetoric that has been directed at Tigrayans, at other people associated with uh, Tigray, uh, it's really harsh uh, talking points that have been used, I've noticed, uh, over the course of the war that has allowed Ethiopians to justify what's happened in Tigray as sort of a uh, an awakening uh, of all the things that the TPLF did when they were in charge. Uh, so, and I want to know just in, in an honest manner, because I think we really do need to have the conversation about 
what is needed to recognize uh, the faults in our relationship in order to reconcile? What, what do you think are some of the biggest um, problem areas when it comes to the conversations on social media or just in, uh, in general about, about what's happened in Ethiopia? I think it's the labeling, right? Um, so when people pretend as if the TPLF were the only ones in power for, for 27 years, forgetting that most of the members of the current Ethiopian government are ex allies with the TPLF under the EPRDF, including Avi himself. So the labeling, I mean, when you say that the TPLF is a cancer that needs to be eradicated at all costs, what does that actually look like? What does that actually look like in real life? You know, um, when uh, the TPLF is referred to as a terrorist group, you know, what does it look like um, living under a quote unquote terrorist group, right? Does that justify not allowing basic public services? Does that justify not negotiating? So I think the labeling uh, that, uh, and, and this is not really a both sides issue. I know both sideism is quite uh, prevalent in this conflict, but I guess the labeling and the delegitimization de of each other has really contributed to a breakdown of, uh, of uh, dialogue. And that's why it's been so easy for atrocities to happen. It's been so easy to see sort of the lack of progress when it comes to negotiating an end to this conflict, because everyone has convinced themselves, especially on the side of the Ethiopian government, that this is a, a divine act, like this is something that has to happen. And um, that is something that is supposed to occur. So I guess I guess that that's what contributes to just how poisonous the rhetoric is. You know, we stop seeing each other as human beings. What, yeah. What do you want? Each yeah. What do you want to know from me about the rhetoric as well? Because I've noticed um, the rhetoric in the Eritrean community is also troubling. Uh, there are people who do support South and uh, have expressed solidarity with the Tigrayans over this issue of being uh, targeted for, a year, for over a year now. Um, but what do, what do you want to know uh, about the other aspect of Eritrean society that supports the regime or is indifferent to what has happened? Um, I guess, you know, I think that's been one of the more unfortunate parts of, of the Twitter wars or the social media wars is to see sort of many justice-seeking um, Eritreans and pro-TPLF to grinds just hammering it out, um, you know, sort of both sides hurling uh, insults at each other. Um, I've seen, and I'm to grind, I've seen many to grinds disparage Eritreans, you know, depicting all Eritreans as sort of complicit in this um, uh, these atrocities and not being able to realize that the vast majority of them have nothing to do with what's going on. Um, we know how, um, I, think, I think we should also talk about sort of the historical em enmity that uh, both sides have sort of happened, had, um, have uh, been engaged in, I guess. I mean, going back to the days of like Rasalula, you know, a Turan warlord making incursions into Eritrea and um, occupying parts of Eritrea during the times. And I think that's what started sort of the the, um, the division. I mean, the vast majority of Tigrayans and the vast majority of Eritreans are of the same ethnic group, really. I mean, Tigrayan speaking. I mean, Eritrea is more uh, diverse. Tigray is relatively homogenous, but uh, uh, in spite of us sharing so much, uh, I think we've seen um, just a breakdown of relations that are coming, that are still affecting us today, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I think, uh, and maybe you can correct me, but I think there's a road in Karen and Asmara that is sort of jagged and uh, twirly. And I think the nickname of that road is Libi, Libi Tigray, which means the heart of Tigray. I don't know if you can- I think I, I'm not familiar with the geography of Karen, but I believe there is a road that says um, essentially uh, this is Tigray and the, the mountain is where it's located and it's due to some proximate issue of 
the relationship between Eritrea and Tigray, which allowed them to, it's kind of maybe an inside joke, I would say. Right, I don't yeah. know. Maybe that trivial trivializes uh, that fact. But I understand what you're saying. It's it's really a, a breakdown of relations between the two uh, entities, Eritrea and uh, Tigray, because, you know, personally, if you ask me, I really don't have an opinion on on Tigray other than to say that they exist. Right. You know? Right. And I also think, uh, I mean, let's just look at historically what has, you know, um, Tigrayan leadership have, have been able to do towards Eritrea yeah. um, when they were in power. I mean, during the border war, they made the Ethiopian army made deep incursions into Eritrean territory, tried to take Asab. Um, many of the same human rights abuses that we're seeing in Tigray were committed against Eritreans by the Ethiopian army, which was then led by, you know, the TPLF yeah. and the Tigrayan political leadership. Some of the same generals that are leading the TDF today, namely Tzadkan, was a participant in that war. Uh, you know, everyone knows about the tens of thousands of Eritreans that were deported or people of Eritrean descent that were deported from Ethiopia and essentially sent to a war zone, even though they had no affiliation with, you know, the Eritrean government. We talked about the incursions made by Rasa Lula and Atsa Johannes that many Eritreans uh, view as occupiers rather than kinsmen. And they're right, rightfully so. I mean, Rasa Lula basically committed a genocide against the Kunama and Nara people, right? Um, and, uh, and during Italian colonialism, you know, as Eritrea developed relative to the rest of Ethiopia, especially Tigray, we saw tens, if not hundreds of thousands of Tigrayans immigrating to Eritrea in search for work. And many of them did work um, low-skilled jobs. Many of them were maids. Many of them were, um, you know, peddlers and, and, and they were disparaged, you know, they came from, they came from much poorer Tigray, they were called Agame or, you know, these slurs. Um, there was sort of an superiority complex that some, not all, but some Eritreans have uh, labeled against it, um, including most of my own family. I, I don't know, I don't know if I mentioned this, but uh, both my parents actually grew up in, in Asmara. Uh, much of my family, uh, actually originates in Tigray, but grew up and was born and raised in, in Eritrea. So there's sort of that connection that I have. Um, so it's safe to say that, you know, I think every Eritrean and every Tigrayan has a responsibility to um, to turn, to, to really look at the rhetoric that we're using. Because it's not only for us, but it's gonna be for our children and our grandchildren. They're going to feel the effects of our enmity and hatred that we might have towards one another. You know, if, if let's say if our grandparents or great grandparents resolve the issues between Eritreans and Tigrayans, maybe, maybe, just maybe, we won't be in the place that we're in now. Does that make sense? I mean, that's just the way that I, that I view it. Um, yeah. It is such an important issue that you mentioned with respect to respectability and also to acknowledge each other uh, because, uh, and as you mentioned, the slurs that were used uh, to describe Tigrayans is unacceptable. And in the same way, uh, the Askaris uh, to describe Eritreans who were under the Italian rule. Uh, I think what mystifies me, um, and I've noticed this in the Eritrean community, is the prevalence that people put on where they're from as a method to somehow prove their credibility in the sphere of the political conversations about Eritrea. Uh, what I mean by that is a lot of Eritreans that I know who are against the regime, they insist that Isaiah Aforki is from Tigray originally. My problem with that is it doesn't matter where he's from. He's still committing human rights abuses. He's still committing war crimes. He's still committing atrocities. It doesn't matter if he's from X, Y, Z. It doesn't matter. And in the same way, it's also been used to disparage people when they criticize the Eritrean government, uh, people um, who, are, who are active and open about their, um, their disagreements about the regime. 
have been called uh, a CIA agent, uh, uh, Weyane uh, Agame, these kind of um, ad hominem attacks that really serve the purpose of uh, discrediting people when it comes to the political conversations that Eritreans have. It, it doesn't make any sense to me. Um, there's nothing wrong with being from Tigray, you know? There's nothing wrong with being from Eritrea. People exist and have always lived in these countries, in these areas uh, for centuries. And um, it doesn't make sense to me how you could just say that you hate someone or you don't like someone because of where they're from. And we saw that, especially in 2020, with the racial uh, reckoning after George Floyd's uh, murder, that people really had to understand, you know, we're all part of the human race. Our skin color may be different, our religion, our language, our ethnicity, our nationality may be different, but we are all the same when it comes to our uh, humanity. We're all people. So I really don't understand how people, uh, how some people in the Eritrean community could say, well, he's not to be trusted because he's not from Eritrea. Well, first of all, is he actually from Eritrea? Just, or is she talk, you know, actually from Eritrea? Just ask and they can prove their lineage. And having to, to face that uh, is, is really damaging on, on a personal level because you're being questioned by your own people uh, and not really being taken seriously when you're asked, you know, are you really Eritrean? Are you really Ethiopian? Are you really, you know, so it just, I don't know, it's just a very uh, disturbing aspect of, of the culture, I would say, you know, you have to be a peer. You have to be this, you have to be this, you know, and it's, it's, it's unfortunate because it shouldn't matter, but unfortunately it does. And also um, going back to what you said about um, the history between Eritrea and Tigray, a lot of people want to dismiss it or just not, you know, say that we're two separate entities. You know, no one is saying that we're the same. You know, maybe Agazian folks who are insistent on, uh, on their own agenda may say so, but I'm not Agazian, I'm not uh, anything uh, that would um, compromise the sovereignty of Eritrea. I fully support Eritrean independence as an Eritrean myself. And in the same way, I support Tigray's autonomy and its ability to sustain itself as its own uh, region. And if they want to declare independence, I, I think that's something that we have to talk about more in detail if that actually comes to pass. But my point is, um, these peoples that make up the, the regions are going to exist after we're gone. And it doesn't help to conflate our hatred for one another, which does exist for no reason other than to serve the political interest of the TPLF or the, PF, the PFTJ. These people are not gonna be there forever. Why should we have to sacrifice everything for them? You know, the government is an institution which derives its ability to govern from the people, from the consent of the governed, essentially. That's one of the fundamental aspects of, of democracy. And if they're not able to do that, I think that really shows the failure of these political parties rather than the people, because the people will always be the first to signal change. And I'm, I'm really talking about to grants in Tigray and Eritreans in Eritrea, not necessarily diaspora because we're, there's some kind of a degree of separation. So I think really that's where my consternation comes from because uh, for decades now, um, the region has been politicized to the point where we really cannot see the humanity in one another. And we just conflate these parties uh, to represent everyone. And it, it really doesn't help uh, when it comes to the overall question of how are we going to get out of this mess. And I think, you know, it's really the youth, um, people like you and me, and even in our, the future generations, who have to take that responsibility to correct wrongs, and also to set the path forward for the future. 
And if people are not willing to have honest conversations, then how can we really advance as people? Um, there's one um, example that I always like to reference, and it's relevant in the, in the context of Africa, which is um, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission that occurred in South Africa after apartheid. Uh, Desmond Tutu, who unfortunately passed away recently, was a spearhead of that uh, after Nelson Mandela came into power as the first black president of South Africa. Um, his, I'm talking about Desmond Tutu, his role in encompassing all of the emotional drama of the country at that time was integral in order to move on from decades of racial separation. And in the same way, it really takes uh, a mature person to uh, lead that sort of effort in Eritrea and in Ethiopia. Because there's so many grievances, not just in Tigray, but so many grievances in other parts of the country um, that make reconciliation nearly impossible because everyone has their own interests that they want to pursue. And also there's histories that people want to accuse others of doing uh, or having been complicit in. So uh, it, it's a myriad of problems that we really have to, re to correct the course uh, in order for history to look back on this time and to say that there was an effort made to uh, establish a peace, which I don't think really is, is what Abi Ahmed or Isaiah Soforki is really after. They, I think from their perspective, they just want to get rid of uh, a political adversary and they have no restrictions on how to do that. Uh, unfortunately, um, it has cost many people their lives. Even today, um, the United Nations um, Human Rights Commission released, uh, or the Human Rights Commissioner, uh, Filippo Grandi, released a statement that uh, Eritrean refugees were killed in airstrikes. And the consequences of, of these actions are really not, are not being felt by the, by the government of Ethiopia. You know, I'm, I think it's just, uh, sometimes when I talk about it, it's, I just feel dis despair because, you know, what could really change their attitude? What could the, what could the international community do to really change the attitude of what's happening in Ethiopia and Eritrea? Because as far as I can tell, there's no one in the government to tell them, you know, this is wrong, or if they have done so, um, the delusion of grandeur that exists is so high that no one is able to really objectively look at the truth and, and assess the situation for what it is. Sometimes I made the comparison, I don't know if it's really relevant or if it's appropriate, but um, during the era of the Iraq war, a lot of people supported the US invasion, uh, which was supposed to topple Saddam Hussein and to get rid of the weapons of mass destruction. And years later, people have since rejected um, their support and people have tried to um, say they were uh, wrong to have supported such a uh, conflict. But I don't know, do you think that people in the future will regret supporting this war? Do you think people will have sort of a retrospective outlook and have an honest assessment of, of their support for the war? It's really easy to support war from the diaspora, but do you think people will actually, you know, resist yeah. that temptation? Yeah, I think I think hopefully in the future, if we learned anything, that um, we're going to sort of look back at this war the same way you described the invasion of Iraq. You know, war fervor after the attack on 9-11 was just at an all-time high. Um, but as the realities of the conflict grew and uh, things started to get revealed, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but uh, the New York Times and the Washington Post actually... Um, uh, actually mentioned that this war wasn't exactly started on November 4th, like the Ethiopian government assistant did, right? I think it's becoming clearer and clearer now that there was some sort of planning that went into it. Um, you, the expose with, uh, um, I forgot her name. Uh, she's from the Somali region. She was formerly a part of uh, the Abu cabinet. Filsan Ahmed. 
Okay, update. Phil Sun, right. Yeah, so she gave her little, uh, she gave her um, expose and she talked about how in the cabinet meetings he hinted towards war. The New York Times report uh, a few weeks earlier talked about how he was planning, uh, Abby was planning a military offensive in Tigray, which I think was always known, to be quite honest with you. I mean, the, the, the parties in this conflict were not particularly um, quiet about it, right? You know, Isaiah Sofurki's first words upon accepting the quote unquote peace deal, what it was game over for Wayane, for, for TPLF, right? So I think we, we saw from him that he wasn't um, exactly uh, willing to just bury the hatchet and move things forward. Um, obviously, on the Tigrayan side, too, you had a lot of rhetoric. You had, um, you know, uh, Alula Solomon of Tigray Media House um, say that. Uh, War and Tigray is our traditional dance, which, you know, just bravado. Um, but, uh, but yeah, in terms of, uh, in terms of how we're going to view this conflict, I think in a few years, we're going to look at it as like a big mistake, totally not worth it, depending how the war goes, right? I think if the Tigray Defense Force has managed to take Western Tigray and there's sort of an understanding that, you know, the conflict's coming to an end, you know, the quarter is open, aid, refugees, weapons can flow in, and there's a real need for just ceasefire and the international community puts enough pressure and the war eventually ends, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, regret um, uh, when the costs of the war become fully realized, right? When people find out, when, when, when Eritreans find out which one of their sons or daughters perished in the fighting. Um, I think I think the grinds are a little different because the realities of war have hit us in the face um, throughout this entire conflict. So I don't. I think we're realizing in the the cost of it now. Uh, the fighting spreading to the Amhara and Afar region for for months, um, they weren't shielded from it either, you know. And I think it hardened a lot of people's stances. But uh, but uh, I think I think this was just um, just a horrendous and pointless conflict that people were really. Um, We'll really have to think about for a while. Well, quickly, just to mention about November 3rd, you know, that attack on the Northern Command happened on the same night as the US presidential election. And I emphasize that because on September 18th, 2001, the Eritrean government decided to crack down on the journalists in the country and also on the political leadership, uh, the dissidents that were against the regime. You know, the Eritrean government really is self-conscious. They really understand the implications of such a drastic move in order to advance its uh, agenda. I don't think this war was spontaneous at all. I think, as you, as you said, correctly so, this was premeditated. And that proof could be used to determine whether what's happened in Tigray is a genocide or not, because most people will say um, that genocide has occurred, but in act, to actually prove that, the intent needs to be documented in such a way where the premeditative actions were used to annihilate the entire Tigrayan ethnicity in whole or in part. And this is a sticking point among many people who are not sure about whether a genocide has happened in Tigray. I don't think I can really make that assertion ultimately because I'm not a lawyer, but um, that is really a piece of evidence that international uh, interlocutors need to observe more um, as the war proceeds or if uh, allegations start to come out, like um, you mentioned with Filsan Ahmed. Um, those kind of whistleblowers that need to speak out about the Ethiopian and Eritrean government's conduct, they're not gonna be uh, in supply. It's gonna, you know, they're gonna resign over time. Uh, maybe over the course of a couple of years, they will slowly feel or show remorse. But even, you know, in the Derg era and afterwards, um, many of those generals, did not express any willingness to concede on their belief about Eritrea's independence. They always maintained the position that Eritrea should have never become independent. And actually, 
the conspiracy between TPLF and EPLF compromised Ethiopia's interest on Eritrea's independence. So there's a lot of um, underlying issues that need to be exposed and actually need to be brought into the open because Filson Ahmed is one person who has a lot of information. How many other people know about what was happening in the war room on November 3rd, November 4th that we don't know about that could actually implicate the governments of very serious allegations. These are not just things that we just say in conversation. These are very important. Um, Omar al-Bashir, who was recently ousted in Sudan, was accused and found guilty of genocide in Darfur, as well as war crimes and atrocities that occurred as a result of his um, non-Arab cleansing of, of Western Sudan. All of these things really need to be brought into focus and to attention because we're losing evidence really quickly. And the Ethiopian government's media blackout, I think, is probably one of the most underrated aspects of this conflict. The early uh, blockage of any media to, under, to investigate what was happening in Tigray has allowed this um, veil of misinformation to really uh, cloud the judgments of, of people. And especially in the Ethiopian diaspora, I would say that they really don't have a full understanding of the consequences of the war because they don't know everything that's happened. They are quick to assume or to deny things. And until there's actually real investigations that take place um, in order to verify claims, the 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 amount of or the extent to which this war has had an effect will only then be understood because, as I mentioned uh, previously, this war has affected so many more people and in, in devastating ways. Uh, on the national level, the economy has gone into ruins. The entire economy has been focused on the military agenda to complete its mission. Uh, and sacrifice uh, Ethiopia's own development. Uh, Ethiopia was growing as a, as a country economically, they were growing. Uh, even the GERD, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which was built by the EPRDF. Uh, now the prosperity party is claiming that they were the ones who uh, came up with the entire idea. That's suffering as well. And Sudan who used to have uh, good relations with Ethiopia, especially um, they weren't uh, really partial on the issue, but they kind of remain neutral. They're kind of siding with Egypt now. And Egypt is using this opportunity to kind of uh, turn Sudan away from Ethiopia. And now Ethiopia is saying, well, Egypt is a, is a uh, accomplice of the CIA. I mean, all of these accusations really are just projections, I would say. They really just show that the Ethiopian government is incapable of managing its own internal affairs. They love to claim that they don't want anyone to interfere, but yet they allowed a foreign country to invade and to attack its own citizenry. I don't think I've ever seen that in history before. I can't think of any example in history where a foreign army was allowed to come into a country and to attack the civilian population. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could think of one, but I can't because it's just unheard of. Yeah, and, you know. Yeah, yeah and, well, I, and as an Eritrean, I just, in my opinion, I think the 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 big or the master, the grand master of this entire disaster is um, is Isaiah Soforki, just based off his longevity, his ability to survive, his ability to see the long term, and also, in effect, to manipulate to Abiy Ahmed. You know, he was really insistent to hesitate, you know, just to deny any peace deal or peace talks with the Tigrayans. And, and, uh, and maybe you can talk about, uh, talk about that. How do you, how do you think Eritrea has, has had a, a role in Ethiopia's affairs? Do you think, how, to what extent do you think that's been uh, an issue for, for Tigray? Um, well, well, to your first, uh, to one of your points, uh, unfortunately, Ethiopia has a history of inviting foreign entities to um, do away with parts of its own 
uh, population uh, in, in 1943, for example, during the Wayana Rebellion in Tigray against Haile Selassie. Um, he invited the Royal British uh, Air Force to bomb Tigray into smithereens, you know, uh, marketplaces, cities. I think 54 bombs were dropped on Makala alone in one day by the British Air Force. And Makala in 1943 was pretty much just an oversized village. So you could just imagine the effect that that had. And um, the legacy of that rebellion still lives today. I mean, that's where the word Wayana comes from. Um, you know, uh, when the Derg was struggling against Somalia in the 1970s, and it looked like they were on the verge of taking the Ogaden, uh, you know, Cuba and all the Eastern Black countries decided to come in and really exert their forces to, to help the Derg. And they were able, the Derg itself was able to recalibrate his focus to Eritrea, which prolonged the Eritrean Civil War um, or War of Independence. So there's, there's a big history. Um, and uh, your question was on uh, Eritrea's involvement. I mean, I think, I think at this point, you know, like I said earlier, you know, Abi's ability to sort of control the different forces in, in the country have has really diminished. I mean, does he really have control over the Amhara militias who are occupying Western Tigray? For what I've seen, it seems like the Eritrean uh, army and and the Eritrean government is relating and talking directly to Gondar and Bahardar rather than Addis Ababa on what to do in Western Tigray. So I think that's one of the more complex things about this conflict and why it hasn't been able to be solved diplomatically because there are just so many different actors with their own interests. And there's this, this big gaping hole of power that um, that is it's just hard to fill, you know? Um, so it's, it's really interesting to see where this, where this heads to. I mean, I think, I still think though, you know, pound for pound, um, the Tigray Defense Forces are probably the most cohesive armed group in the country. I mean, they're pretty well led, you know, they're led by um, former members of the Ethiopian army, people who helped fight the Derg back in the 70s and 80s. Um, but how, uh, how cohesive is the NDF right now? How cohesive is the Amhara militias? Are they even on the same page? Um, you know, is, is a you know, is, an, is a Sidama Ethiopian soldier going to risk his life to defend the territorial claims of Amhara nationalists? Is that something that that person relates to? Um, so there's so many variables. And I think, uh, I think that's what's contributed because it's not just between Abi and TPLF. It's Abi and TPLF, but also Gondar and Bahadar and Asmara and you know the UAE is involved trying to sell weapons and it, or you know it's, it's just a big puzzle and a big maze it's a devastating uh, conflict it's it's brought so many uh people uh to suffer needlessly and uh, I'm not sure if we can solve all the issues in one conversation but just to wrap up um what more do you want to know about uh Eritrea's um, role going forward. Um, we probably already can uh, speculate a little bit about Ethiopia and Tigray because they are really the main actors in the conflict, but um, Eritrea's role, not just in, in the military pursuit of Ethiopia's interests, but also in the conversation of, of uh, reconciliation, of, of post-war conversations, of of uh, a reckoning, social reckoning. Um, do you think uh, you want to speak with other people about this, or do you would you like to see a panel of people to air their grievances, or what is it more that you think uh, the Eritrean community and the Tigrayan community should do to address uh, the war in a frank manner? Um, yeah, I think I think. Um... You know, I think both sides, quite frankly, and I don't like using the word both sides, but I think uh, both sides need to have an honest accounting on what has been done to each other, not not uh, just related to this war, but also historically, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the wounds of 1998 are still, uh, of the border war in, in 1998 and 2000, still, um, is still a, a point of contention, you know? 
you know, history didn't start on November 2020, right? So I think we all need to have an honest uh, assessment on how things got to where they were. Um, I think we need to have a lot more respect for each other, uh, quite frankly. I mean, I'm seeing one, you know, and forget Higdaf. I mean, we know that they're sort of lunatics, but, uh, but you know, seeing, seeing, like I said, you know, and anti-PFDJ or trans integrants at each other's throat on Twitter. I mean, we're supposed to be united, you know? We both have a similar goal. We're both against the war. We're both against the presence of Eritrean troops, right? There's no reason for us to disparage each other. There's no reason for us to insult each other's history. You know, there's no reason for us to sort of, you know, on the one hand, you know, we have one person saying, oh, TPLF didn't do much during the war against the Dirk. Another hand is saying, oh, the TPLF saved the EPLF at the Sahel. Like, we need to understand that we both work together and we both are able to come accomplish a really incredible feat, you know, bringing down the Dirk regime. And I feel like if we put our differences aside and have an honest conversation with each other, that something like that can actually occur. We can accomplish something great like we have in the past. We have a history of working with each other, you know, during the Civil War uh, back in the 70s and 80s and early 90s, you know. So uh, the history is there, uh, but the willingness to do, to do it and the willingness to acknowledge what has happened has to be there also. Do you think it's, um, and maybe we could talk about this um, in a next uh, conversation, but do you think that part of the reason why Tigrayans and Eritreans have not been able to work together is because of this strong uh, sense of identity and, and nationalism? They're, they're two very proud peoples. And I've noticed that sometimes um, on both sides, there's uh, an attempt to dismiss the achievements of the other and also maybe to embellish the achievements of, of one other. Um, do you think that uh, a, a new set of leaders needs to take office or uh, in the public forum uh, in order to straighten out the issues that we have with one another? I think, well, I mean, as far as a new set of political leaders, I don't think that's going to happen. I think Isaias and the PFDJ and TPLF and Integrai are just there to stay. Uh, but what, what we can control is new leadership on the public level, right, on the public forum, right? Um, you know, this conversation that we're having now, that, that can be an example of it, right? Uh, so I think that's the, that's the part that, that we can control most directly, right? Which voices do we elevate? Um, how willing are we to put each other in check? How willing are we to put ourselves in check? That's something that's directly under our control. And I think if we're able to foster a good uh, set of relations on the public level, on the public forum, it might translate to the political, right? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's sort of the way I've been viewing it. Well, Asmaram, I'd like to give you the final word. All right, thanks. Thanks for having me, George. You know, I was a big fan of your content for, for months throughout this conflict. Hopefully this will be the start of a new sort of partnership going on, or we can do more videos or we can collaborate more in one way, uh, in more ways. And I think, uh, I think this was a good start. I was a little nervous to not going to lie. I'm not used to speaking and especially without material in front of me, but, uh, I think, uh, I think we are able to get our points across and I think a lot of people might benefit from our conversation. Certainly, Asmaram, I, well, I'd like to thank you. I, I, as, as you mentioned, um, this is an informal conversation between uh, Eritrean and Tigrayan. We don't have anything prepared. We just wanted to talk off the cuff about issues that are concerning us. And I think it is important, as you said, to find a way to see eye to eye and to establish a, an understanding between our communities because uh, the war has devastated uh, the region. And in order for us to heal from it and also to understand all the perspectives, we need to hear from different people. So uh, thank you so much, Asmaram. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Take care and uh, see you soon.